for the mile. 5.599. Speed, 6.42. When at last it happened, there was a brief moment of stunned disbelief. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, yes, I haven't right. got all the times yet, but certainly we now hold the mile record. I don't know about the kilometre, but um, we'll find out from our learned friend on the right here. Well, regrettably, we didn't get that one, but this one suits me fine. Richard, many, many congratulations. Was it all worth it? Oh, God, yes, God, yes. It's just beginning to sink in just what we've done. <laughs> Can you try and explain to me, why did you do it in the first place? Ah, uh, well, I suppose for Britain and for the hell of it. <laughs> the bald facts are these. That on the Black Rock Desert of Nevada, on Tuesday, October 4th, 1983, a 34,000 horsepower Rolls-Royce Avon-powered jet car, inspired and driven by Twickenham businessman Richard Noble, achieved an average speed of 633.468 miles per hour. By making two transonic runs in opposite directions within an hour, thrust two broke by more than 11 miles per hour, the 13-year-old record of 622.407, held by Californian Gary Gabalich, and his rocket-powered car, Blue Flame, and brought the record back to Britain. The last Englishman to hold it was Donald Campbell in 1964. Noble, his team, and 200 British companies who had backed the 1.5 million pound project had been vindicated. But this, the third attempt, had again been plagued by problems, climatic, mechanical, and financial. Noble knew that this year could be the last. In the end, all sponsors expect results. Thus was exceeded, for the 62nd time, a record set in 1898 by Count Gaston de Chasseloup Lobat in his electric-powered Jean Tau. His 39.2 miles per hour was slightly slower than the cycling record of the time, but it launched the odyssey of the fastest men on earth. 100 miles an hour, 5 miles a minute, 1 mile and 12 seconds, an achievement which balks the imagination and beggars description. Sir Malcolm Campbell, who has often talked to you from this screen as editor of British Movie Turn News, has attained this amazing velocity, his life's ambition. And in these first pictures to be received from Utah, Movie Turn is able to visualize for you the thrilling scene. The climbing gear is ticking over as the car enters the measured mile. That was 238 miles per hour, faster than any other living man has yet travelled on land. Sir Malcolm is satisfied, as you can see, with his trial. And after hoisting himself out of his famous car, which is covered with flying salt, he tells you of his... Men like Malcolm Camp and later his son Donald provided the inspiration for Richard Noble. And it is their mantle that in fulfilment of a dream held since the age of six, he now rightfully assumes. Though it was from the flamboyant American, Gabalich, that he would wrest the title and his passport to land speed history. The crew rushes to the car, alone on the course. On that run, 627.287 miles an hour. Ladies and gentlemen, the world's land speed record has been broken. There's something about running for a, la a world land speed record officially that, uh, to me, uh, is unbeatable as far as racing. It's something that's hard to really describe, except that it's, uh, it's you and the elements, and it's mating yourself with a machine and the technology and your team
and doing something together and being a part of history, a piece of history. All dreams have their beginnings. And for Noble, it was Thrust One, designed and built by himself to show potential sponsors he was serious. She was described as a cathedral on wheels. But by 1977, she was rolling. The lesson learned, Noble started again. And this time, with designer John Aykroyd, he got it right. Good morning, and welcome to Project Thrust. Now, just have a look at that. She's already, she's finished. Noble had harnessed the funds, support, and skills of some of Britain's top companies and the services of some of their best technical specialists. We all need a lift at the moment in this country, and if we could do this for Britain, that would be super. Yet how naive the British had been when first they set foot on the Bonneville Salt in 1981. There had seemed endless reasons for confidence. Noble had steamrolled his way through all the skeptics who said that he would not make it even as far as the first metal being cut. Thrust 2, the most stable land speed record car ever built, is a truly formidable machine with the power of 1,000 British Leyland Minis. It is built to full aerospace standards and in that sense is a land-bound aircraft but its controls are those of a car. The accelerator, like an automatics, with kick down bringing in the afterburner. The brakes differ only in the parachutes precede their operation. It is even a two-seater. The second cockpit used initially to give 200 mile per hour rides to press and sponsors. It can out-accelerate Concorde, going from standstill to record speeds and back to a standstill in a minute. The Bonneville salt flats had been the home of latter-day record breaking. But in the years since Gabalich had set his record, they had deteriorated badly, the crust obscuring the soft mud below, now just a couple of inches deep. From the moment of its first tentative 100 mile per hour run, Thrust 2 had made it clear it did not like the surface one bit. Capable of speeds too fast for tires, Thrust 2 and its weight was being supported on four inch wide solid aluminium wheels. They cut ruts in the crust. The salt clung to and solidified on the rims and each run meant hours of work cleaning them again. At 250 miles per hour, centrifugal force threw the salt off the wheels and thrust would start to plane. But still, she weaved uneasily down the 11 mile track. The speeds edged higher, 290 miles per hour, then 390. But already it had become apparent that the carefully graded track would not be enough. Thrust could not run back down a course she had just traveled. If she did, she would veer wildly in her own tram lines. The first doubts began to creep in, together with the first signs of bad weather. The doubts were manifold about the course, about the car. Was it simply too big? Too heavy, too narrow-wheeled for a record breaker. And, almost inevitably, there was a deeper doubt. Noble's original dream had brought it all together. But now, facing his moment of truth, of having to drive the beast, mainly of his own creation, was he, in fact, up to it? It was a doubt aired almost shamefacedly by some of his team in quiet, foot-shuffling moments while, increasingly, they waited for the wind to drop or showers to abate. All clear, let it roll. He's rolling. He's rolling. There he goes. October the 10th, and on the day's first run, Noble hit 392 miles per hour. And using the afterburner for the first time, 
recorded 440.906 miles per hour for a two-way average of 418.118. Campbell's record as the fastest Briton was now his. So that means we came out of the measured mile about 450. By the next morning, Bonneville was a lake. The British had no option but to pack up and go home. Haunting their departure, a number of questions. Could the car make it? And if the car could, could the driver? And would the sponsor stand another year or pull the plug? The answer to the last question, a firm yes, came quick enough. Those to the others would have to wait another year. Nineteen eighty two should have been the year. Cynical by now about Utah people's claims that the salt flats were usable into early December, the team resolved to hit the flats in high summer. Painstaking work over the winter to refettle the car and remove the last traces of corroding salt had brought Thrust Two to peak condition for shakedown runs on an RAF airfield. The chute's tied up. The chute hasn't opened. The chute's knotted. He swerved off. He's crashed. He's right into the trees. Yeah. Bodywork, suspension, engine, all were damaged. Noble had miscalculated, kept his foot down a fraction too long. Instead of the planned 230 miles per hour, he had reached 300. In a matter of seconds, the project had travelled to the brink of disaster. Hi, Tim. How are you? Hello, Richard. Hey. Hey, I'm all right. Yeah, I'm all right. Yeah. We're uh, a little bit better. Put it right, okay? We're pretty right. We're okay. No problem. We're we'll good there. Now the true strength of the disparate team Noble had forged around himself began to emerge. After removing the engine at Greenham Common, the mangled car was moved to the project workshops at Fishbourne on the Isle of Wight. With a speed and determination which surprised even the team itself, they rebuilt it in under 12 weeks. It was at Bonneville, ready to run by September 26th. I think one of the great fascinations of record breaking because it's got every kind of challenge you could imagine. You know, you've got the appalling financial challenge uh, of getting, the, getting a project like this together, keeping it going, keeping people paid, keeping the momentum going. Um, to give an example of that, the turnover, that's the amount of money we spend on the project each year, has to treble. And that puts a tremendous sort of strain on us all. Uh, and um, you've got that aspect of it. You've got the fun of getting the, all the fascinating personalities together who you've met um, uh, and keeping them on the job um, and then you've got the, the management of a, of, a, of a project like this which is uh, as Ken has found is a very very interesting situation because um, you've got a mix here of people who are paid employees and people who are who are doing this for the fun of it they've given up their maybe their holidays they've given maybe taken unpaid leave from their jobs to do it and um, the management of a venture like this is very very different because I believe in the in the olden days you had a situation where maybe you had um, somebody like Sir Malcolm Campbell who paid for everything, and when he paid for everything, he could he could order everybody around and so on and say this is what we're going to do, etc., etc. 
But um, in Thrace, this has to be a much more democratic process. And I think it's, a, although it tends to be a little bit lengthy at times, it really does result in some, some very definite results, very good, positive stuff. And uh, we work together very happily as a team. But on September 27th, the day of the rescheduled first run on the Salt Flats, Noble and Ackroyd went swimming instead. Common sense seemed to dictate that there was nothing to do but, once again, pack up and start the 6,000-mile trek home. But land speed record-breaking is not about common sense. It is about guts, determination and perseverance. We were having a dinner in the State Line Casino, sitting right opposite Ken Norris, and uh, as he sat down, having announced to the team that they had had it for 1982, he said, if only there could be somewhere in this country where we can run it. We've been to Iran, we've been to South Africa, and, uh, you know, if only there was somewhere fairly close by, we could run it. And as I was sitting so close, I thought to myself, well, what do you really need? So I asked Ken, what do you need? He said, I need a minimum of 11 miles, flat, clear of scrub and dry. And uh, I'd been camping out here on the Black Rock Desert before, so I knew that there was that sort of area. So I suggested the Black Rock. Gerlach is reached along a thin ribbon of tarmac, threading northwards from Reno through 107 miles of wilderness and mountains. With a population of about 150, it is the last stopping off place for hunters. Not without reason does the sign on the general store proclaim that this is where the pavement ends and the west begins. Just beyond here is High Rock Canyon, where the last Indian massacre took place in 1911. There's the remains of an old cavalry fort. Your Mustangs live in the Calico Mountains, just beyond the white ones, which you can see here. A steamboat mountain just down there, where eagles nest on the top. And the whole area is full of fascinating wildlife and flora and history. You know what Rolls Royces are, of course, don't you? Well, the, our driver, Richard, says that the ride in it on this kind of material is just like being in a Rolls Royce. And at Bonville, he was shaken around a lot, and that does make for quite a lot of comfort. At long, long last, we have found the right surface for this car. And as you can see with Black Rock, I mean, we've got a situation here. We've got 120 square miles of, um, of surface which we don't have to grade, which we don't have to prepare. And um, I, uh, I think it's absolutely outstanding. Bonneville had that feeling about it, having seen the films over and over again of people crashing. And when we got there, it had a feeling of disaster in a way. But this place is different. It's new. Nothing awful's happened here. And it won't. Not now. Although Noble had found a desert, there was no guarantee of a run. Environmentalists, without so much as a courtesy call in the British, successfully sought to ban them, and the Federal Bureau of Land Management delayed the issue of a permit. For ten days, the team stood idle before permission to run came through, only to be withdrawn hours later, just after Noble had made a 400-mile-per-hour run. The people of Gerlach rose in defense of the British, and a delegation traveled to the federal courthouse in Reno, demanding that Thrust be allowed to run. Good morning. Good morning. We're representatives of the Sherlock Empire, 
and we'd like to present you with this petition that we had taken up out there. That we feel that the thrust team that should have a right to try their speed record on the Black Box Desert. In front of the Reno TV networks, now well aware of the British presence, the Bureau of Land Management restored the permit. Because the BLM had banned the use of marker dye, Ken Norris marked Noble's 16 lanes of track in a manner unprecedented in record history, simply by driving the Jaguar fire engine in unerringly straight lines. Tire marks and a flag at each mark would be Noble's only signposts. The FOD plod. Each of the 16 12-mile tracks had to be walked to find any foreign objects which might chip Thrust's wheels or which might be sucked into her virtually irreplaceable engine. Even more worrying, the Black Rock Desert had been used as a bombing range by the US government in the past, and every winter's rain would reveal its quota of decaying and unstable explosive. Just one mile, and this is only an 800 foot wide section. Pretty unexciting, really. A load of rocks, each of which would stop a world land speed record. A bit of farmer's wire. There's a rusted up bit of hawser from towing drogues for shooting at. There's uh, a bit of fodder's brake from a previous land speed record attempt. And glass, God knows how that gets out here. And that's it. Very disappointing. No live ammunition, so the sheriff can rest easy. They're apparently 2.75s. Yeah. So the bad though. shape is there in this red. Yeah, there's no way to tell what, exactly what they are. Take them back. These are 2.75 inch rocket warheads. In the condition they're at, it's impossible to tell whether they're just practicing inert-filled or expel, fill explosively. Uh, so we'll have to uh, make sure to destroy them. What would it do to the jet car? Uh, <laughs> it would probably, t since it's probably of light construction, it would probably do quite a bit of damage if it went over it and uh, would hit it and you know, go depending on where it went off and so forth. It would probably put a lot of holes in it in your machine. <laughs> but now. After two poor runs at under 400 miles per hour, a trip to the U.S. Navy's Fallon Air Base was needed. Engine and afterburner were overhauled during tie-down tests lasting far into the night. At last, the dancing diamonds, symbols of a functioning reheat, were back. Runs continued and the speeds climbed inexorably. Any doubts about Noble's ability were replaced by a growing sense of shame that they had existed at all. Tiredness that you're feeling at the moment, is it physical or mental or a combination it's, of both? Yeah, it's totally mental. I mean, you, you, you're, uh, it's just a very, very high pressure minute. <laughs> and it's totally, absolutely knackering. Anyone who gets into a car drives at 650 miles an hour, then jumps out and says, my God, I'm still alive, then has to do it again, deserves my support. Richard is an extraordinary man, and not least, I think, because he's treated the whole project thrust affair like, like a high-risk high management project. I mean, what he's done right from the start, he, he set out what he wanted to do, he defined the problems of it, the finance, the logistics, the manpower. 
And he set them up and knocked them down one by one. And if you look at it in that sense, I mean, driving was simply the last obstacle to be overcome, just like any of the other problems. I've watched this guy for five years now, and throughout that period, I've never seen his public composure crack. It didn't happen at Bonneville in 81. It didn't happen after, after the crash at, at Greenland. And, you know, a lot of his team say they, they still don't know Richard, that, that he's a mystery to them. And I can understand it in a way. And I think the answer is that he's, he's lived with the project for so long, for, for nine years, that that public front that he's had to put up to sponsors, to everybody else, has taken the guy over. And, and, and the quieter and the gentler Richard has disappeared under that hard public shell of determination and commitment and the rest of it. But for each one of us, um, it, it's a personal goal. It's as if we're there, we're in that car with him. And uh, that's, that's why we're still here, that's why we're still trying. Each one of us has a personal goal, but I think each one of us is riding with him in spirit every time he lights that car up. Hey, Richard was wor is working with a, a technical masterpiece. That's about it. We opened the cockpit and warm, gave yeah, Richard that's... fresh air, and um, uh, Richard was sat there quietly doing his um, brief, writing. Now, a man who's frightened don't sit down writing. When you think of a car that's worth a million pounds and total driving experience is just over one hour, uh, and that man's got to get in there and go 650 miles an hour, um, the team knows he's got courage. But nature was poised to pounce. For yet another 10 days, the team stood idly by, waiting for the desert to dry. Most of the course, right from mile north, new mile north up. Well, I, I wouldn't have believed that you could have so many misfortunes come in, in so many different forms for so for so long a period um you know at the end of bonneville last year i thought well you can really um you know people have got to earn the, earn their record and this was this was really bad luck um next year it's going to be almost a formality finally it dawned bright and clear with snow forecast just a day away, Ken Norris judged it was worth having another go. <laughs> uh, Got to get it all feathered and smoothed off because of the wind. As Brian said, we're putting on two coats to go supersonic. <laughs> Even though the track was soft and muddy in places, thrust thundered in and out of the mirage, peaking at 615 miles per hour. But the average was only 590. Still 40 miles per hour short. So, we've got an interesting situation. Uh, we want a hotter day, we want a dry course, and we want a little bit more power. The meeting that night found the thrust team badly divided. We could say, all right, let's defy the weather again. Let's take the vehicle down to a tethering point. Let's tweak up the engine in a proper manner. Let's take the thrust, measure the thrust, decide that we have enough thrust, come back and have another go. Well, I just that's strange. We had 12 weeks prior. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. The strain started 
in an intense manner before running at Greenham with a build up to running at Greenham and it hasn't let off for one day since and personally I've had it. Uh, if we decide to go home and to try and enlist Rolls Royce's help I will get the money. Simple as that. Two days later winter settled on Gurla for good. But once again, the British were arriving on the desert late. This time, the cause was far outside the team's control. The winter's legacy to most of Western America had been one of chaos. In the Sierra Nevadas, an unprecedented 60 feet of snow, three times the usual amount, had fallen and flooded the Black Rock Desert below. It had taken until September to dry. For many weeks, Noble and sponsors had agonized, should the whole project be stood down for another year. But now, the weather window they had been waiting for seemed to be open. Finally, the button was pressed, the biggest gamble so far underway. Pressures on Noble were now enormous. Deep down, he knew this could be his last chance. Back in the UK, there was growing skepticism. Funds were short, and there was no way of knowing when the weather might break. I really admire Richard for, for his perseverance in being able to put this program together because I know he has been struggling with it for a long time and, and, and there's many times when I feel like giving up. I, you, know, you just get fed up with rejection and, and things that don't go right. If somebody knocks you down, you have to be able to just get up and say, well, I got knocked down that time, but you know, I learn I can't take that left jab anymore. I'm just going to have to get back up and do it again. And that's really what it takes. And so, on a dirt road by the garage on the edge of town, the team began to groom thrust for what lay ahead. Everybody in this town is a happy city to trust you because maybe you put good luck in the map. Everybody knows good luck, he got the record, the war speed record. Well, they're all thrilled to death and very hopeful that you can break this world speed record. And uh, they've all been for it, uh, I say all, hopefully all of them, because the big majority certainly have. And uh, it's... Uh, it's certainly a tremendous step in progress when the teams come through there at uh, two and a half to three miles an hour. Now we're going to get across it at 600 and something miles an hour, huh? A little difference. Yeah. Once again, preparations went ahead. Once again, the course was surveyed. Once again, Norris proceeded with the task of checking desert firmness. What I'm doing is pushing this in to test the subsurface for bearing resistance. And I'm getting some pretty high readings here. It's going up six on this California bearing ratio machine, going up to towards 10 and increasing on resistance, which is what we want. This is a very good part of the desert for load bearing and should be perfectly okay to run thrust. Finally, on September 17th, on a test run scheduled to hit 300 miles per hour, thrust hit a peak speed of 460 miles per hour, 
using a run-up of only three quarters of a mile. Rolls-Royce had retuned the engine specifically for the Black Rock Desert, and thrust was proving that she was ready to go. But alas, winds were gusting to 15 knots, and United States Auto Club officials stopped any further runs. OK, Dave, well, uh, the wind's still gusting up to At high speeds, a side wind so of over five knots that, could be um, catastrophic. We're going to be stuck here for at least a half an hour. This is control standing by. In fact, it was three days before thrust ran again. Thank you, pit station. And so the thrust team was into another boring period of waiting, something they had become very adept at coping with. This is control to Blue Flame 2. You're free to go. Go through the Black Rock Desert at speeds of over oh, 600 well. miles an hour on the loop. Oh, once I was in motion, I, I felt no vibration whatsoever. Oh, She's brilliant. just perfect, this machine. Steers well. So really, you thank the machine? It is the machine. Why did you do it? Well, it's like mountains, you know. They just happen to be there. What about the future now? Have you any ambitions left? You know, I want to break the sound barrier. <laughs> 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 Get him off. On September 22nd, Noble charged once more towards the measured mile. reached a peak speed of 617 miles per hour. But to do it, she had used the full six-mile run-up. To make matters worse, the engine had flamed out, extinguishing itself right in the middle of a run. It wasn't the best time for visitors, even distinguished ones like Gary Gabalich. Yeah, Mark, not have you right next to me. <laughs> nice run. Not really, guy. Well, Could have done a hell good. of a sight better than that. Yeah. Make sure we got everyone. Where's Dave? Yeah. Where's Dave? Dave is around. It's just Dave. Oh, Dave. Dave. Oh, 
this for, this is the first time I've seen this car. Really? Yeah, really. I've never uh, never really looked at it this close. <laughs> what do you I've think? Seen pictures of it. It's nice. It's nice. Hold you on here just to tell you, you know, what's happening today. We have got problems because basically that run was not much better. It was two miles an hour better only than the last run. And the problem seemed to be... As ever, uh, Noble put on a calm front. But major engine damage was suspected. So Without immediate help uh, from Rolls-Royce, team leaders believe Project Thrust was sunk. Continuing your run. So that's why we've aborted the run today. I don't think it's a serious problem. We have to analyze it, and also we should be waiting for our engine specialist from the Royal Air Force who's coming out um, this weekend, and then we can tackle it. Within hours, George Webb, a Rolls-Royce technician from Atlanta, and John Watkins, the team's engine specialist from the RAF, had flown in. Somehow, the engine had survived. Faults were cured, and a tie-down test set for Reno Airport. After giving the engine a compressor wash and adjusting settings on the reheat nozzles, thrust was run to full power with the afterburner on. car and team were now ready. Surely nothing else could go wrong. Or could it? The rain had returned, and 6,000 miles away in London, sponsors grew increasingly nervous. Already broke, the team learnt that one of the largest sponsors, Fabergé, had suddenly pulled out. We were something in the region of £20,000 short at a time when the record was almost there. Suddenly, it all came right. The other main sponsors, Initial Services, GKN, Champion, Castrol, Plessy, Trimite, and Loctite, had traveled the final mile and were immediately labeled the Magnificent Seven. There was 20,000 pounds, enough for one more week. Let's go and do it. Yep.
Was it worth it? Yeah, every second of it. Every agonising second of it. Did you wonder about it sometimes? Though? Yes, I did. <coughs> what about you, Gordy? I think it was great. great. A wonderful oh, no. sight. Wouldn't have missed it in the world. Did you think it was going to happen? I knew it was going to happen. So when he shut the door and he go. zoomed up, he said, this is going to be 6.36 on this run. And, and that was before he made off. it. Can you believe that? Yeah. yeah. You're going to celebrate that tonight? Oh, yes. boy. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> For the first time in his life, he's going to get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll take a lot. <laughs> Everybody close together. I'm sorry to sound... Much, much closer together. Much closer together. And to team, Richard. Team. So can I just ask the gentleman on the right, can they go to that side? At the end of the project, you always get um, an enormous letdown, whether the end is successful or inconclusive, because, of course, suddenly you're dismantling everything you've worked so hard to put together. We're all going to get terrible withdrawal symptoms. So the thing is, we've, we've done something, or we've been involved in something, which is so remote from everyday life, with enormous um, risks, and it's going to be very, very difficult to pick up the threads of a normal life again. India's Gujarat is home to a controversial clinic where families from all over the world can pay local women to bear children for them. Is it exploitative? Or does it give local women a chance to escape poverty? House of Surrogates, here on BBC Four, next. <laughs>